Good afternoon, YouTube, and welcome back to the Suburban Proletarian. My name is Greg, and today I want to roll the clocks back about eight months or so. In the middle of January this year, I started this brand new channel, and I posted my first video, which was an unboxing and quick first look at a brand new watch that I had just received for Christmas, and of course that was the Rado Original Diastar XL, which I'm holding in my hand right here right now and it's been an incredibly popular video uh, I think to date it's garnered over 5,000 views which is not really all that impressive by the big boy standards I know some guys will get 5,000 views on a video in a couple of days some of the really big guys will get 5,000 views in a couple of hours but Considering the fact that right now the proletariat is less than 100 strong, I think we've got a little bit more than 80 subscribers as I film this, that's pretty darn good. I, my other channel, which has been around for a long time, The Suburban Rifleman, I have one video with uh, I think about 11,000 views. But you have to take into account that video's been up for 11 years. So that's only like 1,000 views a year. And I believe that I promised a follow-up when I posted that original video. I have, in fact, had the chance to wear the watch for about six months now. I've been nothing but impressed with this watch. I want to talk about it a little bit more. But I also want to go into the history of Rado just a little bit. I tried filming this video the other day, and it got really, really long, and I got really, really off in the weeds, and I just abandoned it. And so I promise I'm going to try to keep this one as short as possible. A lot of people might think that would be really pretty easy, because the vast majority of watch enthusiasts really seem to think that Rado doesn't have any history at all. And it is true. Uh, they can't trace their heritage back to the late 18th century. Um... Rado wasn't the first watch company to summit Everest. And Rado isn't the official timekeeper of Formula One racing or the Olympics or the Tour de France or some other monumental event. But I would argue there are other ways of gauging a watch brand's history. Rado as a brand only dates back about 61 years. And in the intervening years, they've made some really revolutionary developments, particularly in the area of high-tech materials. I'll talk about that in a few moments. But when Paul Lutti started the Rado brand as we know it today in 1957, he knew he was coming late to the game. Uh, the world was absolutely saturated with Swiss watches. And he looked for underdeveloped and underutilized markets that he could exploit uh, to help his fledgling watch company along. And he decided to focus on Southern Asia and South America in specific. Rado is not particularly well received in, uh, or well known, I guess I should say, in Western Europe and North America, but it is an intrinsically Swiss watch brand. Um, as a matter of fact, it's, I believe, either the best or certainly one of the best selling Swiss watch brands in Switzerland today and has been for a long time. But when Paul Lutti decided to focus on South Asia and South America as his primary target markets, he realized that certain areas in these regions receive enormous amounts of rain every year. And so he endeavored to make his watches as waterproof as possible. He also realized that the areas that didn't get a lot of rain tended to be very sandy and dusty and uh, very abrasive in general, and so he also endeavored to make his watches as scratch-proof as possible. Um, the first watches, he did a pretty good job with the waterproofing, uh, the green and golden horse series, and uh, I think the purple gazelle. There were all kinds of colors and animals associated with his early watch models. Tended to be quite waterproof and very rugged, but they were largely made from fairly conventional stainless steel, so they did scratch. And he tried to address this in 1962 by introducing what has probably become the most iconic of all Rado watches, and that would be the original Rado Diastar. Um, Rado refers to it today as the Diastar 1, and I will refer to it as the Diastar 1 to differentiate between it and this watch in this review. Now, the Diastar is definitely a Marmite watch. 
there are not too many people who are on the fence about it. Uh, the styling in particular is uh, very divisive. Most people either hate it or they love it. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of watch enthusiasts come down on the hate it side of the fence. But regardless of how you feel about the watch's styling, it's definitely a case of form follows function. The Diastar was marketed as the world's first scratch-proof watch. And the reason behind that is this broad expanse of shiny metal around the crystal, which Ratto refers to as hard metal, but is in fact tungsten carbide. And we're all familiar with tungsten carbide. It's used to make the cutting edges of saw blades and drill bits to make them extremely wear resistant. And in the case of the Diastar, it makes the watch extremely scratch resistant. Uh, as I said, it's very hard. Uh, it takes supposedly two weeks to polish one of these bezels. Um, but you can see examples of this watch from 1962 or a few years after that. So watches that are getting uh, close to being 60 years old that still look essentially brand new. And that's thanks to this tungsten carbide bezel. Another feature that uh, Rado included in the Diastar was a sapphire crystal. Now, they were not the first company to use sapphire, synthetic sapphire, as a watch crystal. That was originally done, I think, in the 1930s or 1940s, maybe by Breguet. But Rado was the first company to go exclusively to using sapphire as a watch crystal material. Um, when they came out with the Diastar in 1962. So, I mean, they're predating Rolex in that achievement by 25, 30 years maybe. That's pretty historical, I would say, for a supposedly not historic watch brand. Now, Rado didn't quit when they started using tungsten carbide and sapphire. They have continued to make advancements in the realm of uh, high-tech materials for manufacturing watches. They were the first Swiss watch manufacturer to have their own metallurgical department. They are not just using uh, materials like tungsten carbide and high-tech ceramic. They're smelting their own materials. They're sintering their own materials. And in fact, they remain to this day sort of the R&D department for the entire Swatch group. In 20 years, when um, Omega introduces the first Space Master that's made with an impact resistant metallic sapphire case, they'll have Rado to thank for it, most likely. But for all their material and design advancements, Rado knows a good thing when they see it, and they're still making that original Diastar, the Diastar 1, in an almost completely unchanged form from the case, the crystal, even dial styles and a bracelet. So while most of Rado's watches were pretty sporty and most of them were made from steel. They didn't really fit the steel sports paradigm. And actually, uh, they did make a few steel sports watches going all the way back to the 1960s. They made a dive watch, which has recently been um, resurrected, the Captain Cook Diver. Definite one on my list of, I don't know about must-have watches, but one that I'd really like to have. And in the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, really basic steel sports watches have become incredibly popular. Watches like the Rolex Explorer. Um, I know the Rolex Explorer has been around a lot longer than 15 years, but it's become really, really, really popular in the last 15, 10 years. Uh, you've got watches like the Omega Seamaster Aquaterra. Uh, basic steel sports watches, rugged, good for the outdoors, uh, a good degree of water resistancy, and no bells and whistles, no fancy complications, no rotating bezels. And it seems like in about 2005 or so, Rado decided that they wanted to get into that same market. And to that end, they developed the watch that we're talking about today, which is the Rado Original Diastar XL. And in order to achieve that, they made some changes to the original Diastar um, to make the Diastar XL the Diastar XL. Uh, as the name implies, they made it extra large. They increased the case diameter horizontally from 37 to 39 millimeters. The original Diastar, the Diastar 1, has always had quite a great deal of wrist presence, but at 37 millimeters, it's pretty small by modern standards. Watches are starting to trend a little bit smaller now, 
But uh, in 2005, when this watch was designed, right around 2005, uh, watches were getting very, very big. So the Diastar XL was increased to 39 millimeters. Um, it was given a screw down crown. Uh, the water resistance was increased from a paltry 30 meters to 100 meters. Um, and the screw down crown is protected by one of the most massive uh, crown guards I could imagine. Instead of having two separate crown guards on either side of the crown, there's one massive guard that wraps, um, I don't know, 180 degrees around the crown across the bottom. Now this crown guard is slightly relieved on the bottom to facilitate unscrewing the crown and uh, hand winding. Neither of those operations is particularly difficult, but it does do an incredible job in supporting the crown. I can't imagine a knock that this watch could take that would uh, significantly damage the crown or stem. They've replaced the original uh, folded stainless steel bracelet with uh, little curly Q folded links with solid links throughout uh, that are pinned. It's got a very nice uh, deployant clasp here with a bit of an extension uh, to help getting over your wrist. The clasp itself is made from titanium, which is more or less inert. It's extremely corrosion resistant. Um, the bracelet is fully adjustable. Um, I was a little concerned. This watch has a retail price around $1,300. And I was kind of concerned that a watch that costs this much, I didn't pay that much for it, by the way. This is the Suburban Proletarian, after all. But the original MSRP was around $1,300. And I was concerned that a watch with such a fairly high price tag um, didn't have any half links in the bracelet, but in fact it does have a half link. I'll point that out during the tabletop. Um, it's just kind of hidden between the final uh, visible link on the bracelet and the clasp body. This is meant to be a steel sports watch in sort of the field watch genre, a la the Rolex Explorer or the uh, Seamaster Aquaterra. And I've seen some people make the argument that 100 meters, despite the fact that it's not a dive watch, 100 meters of water resistance really isn't sufficient for a field watch. And I tend to agree with that. If you go by most companies' definition of water resistance, most watch enthusiasts quickly learn that there are many different water resistance ratings. There are seven general classifications of water resistance that are used more broadly than anything else. One of which is just the marking water resistant. Then you have 50 meters, 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters, 600 meters, and 1,000 meters. And these are largely defined in the same way across the board by most watch uh, manufacturers. Most watch manufacturers that just mark their watches as water resistant, if they're pressed on the issue, will tell you that water resistant means 30 meters. And you might think, hey, great, 30 meters, that's over 100 feet. I'm never going to be more than 100 feet underwater. That should be good for just about everything, except it's not. If you read into what 30 meters of water resistance qualifies you for doing, it's basically walking in the rain and maybe washing your hands, but not your wrists. 50 meters of water resistance generally gets you a little bit more. Um, they say you can actually wash your hands, maybe do the dishes carefully, but don't actually immerse or submerge the watch in water. 100 meters, you start getting statements about, oh, well, now you can go swimming, but you still can't go even snorkeling or water skiing or jet skiing. It isn't until you get to 200 meters, 300 meters, 600 meters, 1,000 meters that watches are really considered to be waterproof. And I have even seen the manufacturers of 600 meter dive watches uh, admonish their customers not to take a shower while you're wearing this 600 meter dive watch. And they, I've heard all kinds of stories. The, the soap uh, will break down the seals. Seriously? You want me to pay, I don't know, two, three thousand dollars for a watch 
and you're using seals that dissolve in soapy water. I've heard stories about how, well, the seals are meant to keep out water, but not steam. And a bathroom is a very steamy environment. I don't know. I don't really buy that. Now, I'll have to say, I've had a lot of 50 meter watches, like the Casio F91W, or uh, very basic Seiko 5s. And I've taken showers and gone swimming with every single one of them. And with only a few exceptions early in my life when I was using really crappy brand watches, I've never had water get into the case of a watch. But I think that if you say that a watch is water resistant to 30 meters, it should be 30 meters. So where am I going with this? Well, if you say that 100 meters isn't sufficient water resistance for a field watch, and you define 100 meters of water resistance, meaning that you can maybe go swimming, maybe, but you can't even go snorkeling, I would agree with you. But then there's the way that Ratto looks at water resistance. I've taken this directly from Ratto's website. Um, their Swiss website has basically this statement minus um, what I have highlighted here. And what I have highlighted here actually appears on their U.S. store website, but it is still officially a Ratto corporate website. And the question in question is, are Ratto watches water resistant? Pretty straightforward. I'm going to read Ratto's answer word for word. You can look it up yourself. All Ratto watches are water resistant to at least three bars, 30 meters, which means that you can go swimming or take a shower while wearing your Ratto. Water resistance is not a permanent condition to ensure permanent water resistance, blah, blah, blah. You can read it yourself. But they're saying that a 30 meter watch, just a basic water resistant Ratto, means you can go swimming or take a shower. Now there are dive watch companies that are telling you you can't take a shower with their 600 meter dive watch. So I tend to believe that if Ratto says that this watch is water resistant, to 100 meters, it's water resistant to 100 meters. And I feel perfectly confident going swimming. I would even go, I mean, this is, I have dive watches. I have a cheap dive watch right here. Um, I probably wouldn't take this snorkeling or recreational scuba diving, but I certainly wouldn't have a problem with doing so. I've had the opportunity to wear this watch now for about six months, and I I have to say, I've been nothing but impressed. It's been in my daily rotation. I haven't worn it every day, but I haven't pulled any punches either. I've worn it outside, uh, working in the yard. I've worn it to work in the woods, groundskeeping. I've worn it in a fabrication shop around heavy machinery. It's taken its fair number of knocks and scratches. The stainless steel bracelet is starting to acquire some scratches, which is something I don't generally worry about too much. But I will have to say, the tungsten carbide bezel ring, the faceted sapphire crystal, which stands very proud of the case, neither of them has gotten any scratches. They look brand new. I know that the styling isn't really for everybody. We'll take a look at that on the tabletop, but so far I've just been very, very impressed. Before we go over and take a look at the tabletop, uh, of course, we've got to do our customary wristwatch check, and today I'm wearing my Casio DW290. It's uh, been described as a pre-shock or the poor man's G-Shock. It's not meant to be a G-Shock at all. I'll be doing a video about this watch in the future. This is just a straight-up dive watch that Casio introduced in the early 1990s. Um, I think it was meant to be sort of a, a less expensive alternative to the G-Shocks. G-Shocks were quite expensive in the early 1990s, uh, more so than they are today. But I think Casio ended up realizing that they were kind of going to end up cutting into their own sales if they promoted it too heavily. And it survived 25 years, I think. It was just discontinued about a year or so ago. This, this example is only about a year old. Um, but it was never really heavily promoted. Uh, I think they had big plans for it when it came out. Um, they certainly put some money into product placement. This was the watch that was on Tom Cruise's wrist in the very first Mission Impossible uh, movie. So, I mean, that's pretty important product placement. And then the watch basically went nowhere. Another watch that has developed sort of a 
strong cult following, uh, but isn't really very well known worldwide. Uh, so anyway, without any further ado, let's go take a look at this on the tabletop. We'll get a better look at the Rado Diastar, and uh, I'll give you my thoughts on it. Okay, so here it is. I want to take a quick look, and I do mean quick look, at the Diastar XL here. Um, I know you guys tuned in to see it up close, but uh, I don't want to waste too much more time. I've already edited the intro to this video, and I, I can only get it down to about 20 minutes. So, uh, But as you can see, the watch is still in remarkably good condition. I've been wearing it for about six months now, and... True to their word, the tungsten carbide bezel and the sapphire crystal are absolutely scratch-free. Rado billed this as the world's first scratch-proof watch, and they were, they were pretty right on the money with that. One might think that the sapphire crystal was particularly vulnerable to scratching. It does stand up uh, fairly proud of the case, but uh, I have not found that to be a problem. I certainly haven't been very careful with this watch. If you look at the bracelet, you can see uh, I'm not one of those guys who puts uh, scotch tape on my clasp to keep it from getting scratched. I usually wear my watches and I allow them to, you know, develop honest wear marks. That doesn't really bother me. Here's that uh, crown guard that I was talking about in the intro. You can see it is really massive and it really does support the crown very well. Um, the crown is signed with the little Rado anchor. Um, what else can I say about it? The deployant clasp is pretty nice with a bit of an extension here that's just held in place with some ball detents. That just snaps in. This closes with uh, two side catches. The half link that I mentioned earlier when it came to sizing the bracelet was originally located here along this line in between uh, the final link of the bracelet and the body of the clasp. It was just a flat, broad piece of stainless steel that was, a, I don't know, maybe an eighth of an inch high this way. When you remove it, it does leave a, sort of a T-shaped gap in here, which is, I don't know, it's a little bit unsightly. Uh, the half link installed, you can't see that pin it's a little bit more of a finished look, but I mean it's inside the clasp. Who really uh, cares too much? So the dimensions of the watch, as I mentioned, are uh, 39 millimeters across, and I was wrong in the intro. They didn't move up from 37 millimeters to 39 millimeters. They moved up from 35 millimeters uh, to 39 millimeters. So it was actually an increase of 4 millimeters in width. Um, there was a three millimeter increase in length. Uh, longitudinally, the case has increased from 43 millimeters to 46 millimeters. So you've got 46 by 39 uh, versus the older 43 by 35. Um, I don't know what to call the lug width. These are really non-conventional uh, lugs. You can see there's a, uh, a piece in the middle here a very specialized bracelet attachment. I don't think your options for aftermarket bracelets, well, really even exist. As you can see with the watch, one problem with it is it is a fingerprint monster. You're constantly wiping the watch to get the fingerprints off of it, but that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Uh, the watch looks so great to my eye anyway. And of course, the little moving anchor you can see that the anchor logo on the dial will pivot. It's in its own jeweled bearing. And so that moves. Kind of a neat little touch. Some people think that's frivolous nonsense, but I like it. The watch has been keeping great time, great accuracy. Uh, it took a little while to settle in. I think it started off at about eight and a half seconds per day fast. And now, I would say over the last few months, it runs extremely consistently at 6.4 seconds fast per day, which is just outside of chronometer standards. I think chronometer standards go from minus 4 to plus 6, so that's pretty good accuracy. I have more accurate watches, but this one's certainly sufficiently accurate to uh, get the job done. It is running a Rado Caliber 658, 
which would imply that it was an in-house movement, and it sort of is because it's all Swatch Group, but of course the Rado Caliber 658 is really just a rebranded ETA 2824-2, and I know there's been some pushback, uh, particularly in uh, luxury or entry-level luxury watches like this one, among watch collectors against watches with the ETA 2824 in them. But as much as some people are probably not going to like to hear me say it, the 2824-2 is a workhorse movement, and it keeps the watch running very smoothly. The uh, hand sweeps the dial very nicely, and again, it's keeping great time, so I, I really can't complain about that. Um, no exhibition case back. The 2824-2 or Rado Caliber 658 doesn't deserve an exhibition case back, and I much prefer the solid case back with this cool seahorse logo on it. You can see it says Diastar on there. A quick loom shot here. Um, as you can see, the watch is no real loom monster, but the Super Luminova does a good enough job to keep it visible till pretty late in the evening, pretty early in the morning. So it, it works. It's not the best, but it's okay. I guess that's pretty much all I can show you about the watch. It's holding up remarkably well. A uh, little Rado signature there on the side of the case. Not uh, Invictus style, you know, in your face, but still a classy little touch that I like. So let's go do the wrap up. I don't think I can talk about this much more uh, without boring you to death. So let's go back and do it. All right, guys, so those are my thoughts on Rado's original Diastar XL. Again, I just can't say enough good things about this watch. I know the styling isn't for everyone, uh, but it's beautiful to my eye, and it certainly has a lot of wrist presence. It's an eye catcher, uh, but at 39 millimeters, it's not too big. It's not uncomfortable to wear, uh, and it's definitely distinctive. If you live in the United States like I do, most people have never even heard of Rado. And nobody's ever seen a watch as radical as this, for the most part. And I think in a lot of Western Europe, you'll find the situation to be much the same. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please go ahead and click the like button. If you hated it, if you think it was too long, go ahead and click the dislike button. You won't hurt my feelings. Well, you might hurt my feelings a little bit, but uh, it helps me to decide what kind of content to generate in the future. If you did enjoy this video and you'd like to see more like it, please consider subscribing to the channel. It only takes a second, it doesn't cost a dime, and each subscription goes a long way to help keep me here on the air. Um, the powers that be in Silicon Valley don't care about total views anymore, they only care about subscriptions. So each subscription really, really helps me out. If you're already a subscriber, go ahead and click that little bell icon down below. That will allow YouTube to send you notifications when I post updates to the channel. And when I do, I hope to see each of you here at that time. Later, guys.